Right, we'll get started. Simon, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Simon King, and I'm the National Business Development Director here at Fries. I uh, hope you're all well, and thank you for joining us this morning. We are again extremely privileged to have Tom Cheesrack with us today, one of the leading futurists in the country, who has worked with some of the leading global brands, including BP, LG, Nikon, and Unilever, in helping them better understand what's next on the horizon, and of course, how to align themselves accordingly. I have known Tom for over six years, and we at Fries have worked closely with Tom over the last four, and see him as a great friend, as well as a trusted advisor and expert in his field. I will be passing you over to Tom shortly, but before I do, just wanted to confirm that there will be an opportunity to submit questions during the talk, although I would add many have been submitted beforehand. And Tom will try and answer as many as he can at the end. You can submit your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom during the session, and we will endeavour to answer all your questions. But those that we can't, we will come back to you independently over the next few days. Now, I'm pleased to pass you over to Tom for today's talk on reality, recovery and opportunity. Tom. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Simon. Right, I'm going to bring my screen up so you've got some uh, slides here. Um, let's bring up this one. Uh, and really this this um, outlines our agenda for today. Uh, I'm very much going to try and break the talk down into those three sections, reality, recovery, opportunity. Um, and as anyone who's been watching the news in the last week will probably guess, um, the reality section is going to be the most downbeat. Um, this is where our sort of dark clouds are lingering uh, and the picture's not so bright. Um, but for the second two thirds, I'm going to try to be as upbeat as I can and talk about some of the opportunities, some of the places where we're going to see recovery. Um, it's going to be measured, I'll be honest, it's not going to be all sunshine, it's going to be more sort of rays of light um, and you'll see that I've sort of captured that uh, imagery as I go through the slide deck. Um, but let's kick off, let's, let's get the bad news out of the way first because it's not a particularly pretty picture. Um, and I know that some of you will you know, know this already. Um, just before I do though, a, a quick caveat. Um, I, when I'm going to give some bad news like this, I find it important to point out that there's a very big difference between uh, what I see and what I want to see. Um, I'm not here to promote a vision of the future, my vision of the future, what I'd like to see in terms of society and business. Uh, I'm here to talk about what I see happening in the current context and particularly looking at that intersection between the trends that we're facing and the existing pressures that we're facing and, and what those throw up. So with that caveat done, let's talk a bit about reality and particularly sort of what's changed since the last seminar. You know, I started this and if you were on the last seminar um, where we talked you know, in sort of similar terms, I've tried to update things since then and refer back a bit to some of the things I said during the last seminar. And, and one of those was um, about the sort of the forecasts from an economic perspective not being very strong and that we probably had more bad news to come. And sadly, that was absolutely true. So yesterday we got the latest figures from the ONS in terms of gross domestic product, GDP. And yeah, I mean, we've actually slightly beaten the worst forecast of about minus 20.4%. But nonetheless, if you take a sort of this on this graph, you know, 100% being uh, where we were uh, Q4 2019, uh, you know, we've dropped the economy dropped off by uh, you know, nearly 20% um, since then. Which, if you know, again refer back to this chart, look back at where it, you know, it maps against this is worse than the situation post financial crash 2008. Um, so a really, really dramatic contraction um, in production and economic activity here in the UK. And I think most of us are feeling that, um, you know, even if it's not, um, if our businesses have been some of the lucky ones, we can certainly see it in the macro environment around us. So no great surprises, but, you know, good in some ways to have it confirmed and that we've, we're slightly better than perhaps the worst case scenario that, that we foresaw. You know, why is this? Why are we in the situation that we are? 
um, because it's not just about the economy, it is about the, the latest numbers in terms of the virus, which are not looking good. Uh, and you know, although there is remained lots of scepticism about the uh, most recent government forecast or government uh, suggestions that the, the virus rate was doubling uh, and I'm back on an exponential curve, you know, certainly the latest figures that I pulled these down, I think three days ago, um, are looking that we're heading right back up towards our peak in terms of cases. Again, lots of debate in terms of what this means. Are we going to see the same number of deaths? So what is the lag between uh, hospital admissions and cases recorded? Is this down to increased testing? You know, by and large, I think a lot of those caveats have been accounted for in these numbers, and we are genuinely seeing a very rapid rise in cases again, as we may have expected as we enter winter and the typical flu season, um, but also due to some other factors. Um, one of which I'll show in a second, and one of which is absolutely the argument that actually we lifted too soon. Uh, for all the need to uh, return some economic activity and offset that incredible drop I showed in the last graph, um, it does look like we have you know, sparked a resurgence in rates um, across the country, across a variety of different demographics as well. Uh, and I think there's a very good argument that perhaps we opened some things too soon or, or did so with insufficient care rulemaking and even where there were those rules we perhaps haven't had the level of adherence that we might need um, in order to minimize the regrowth of the virus and, and clearly you know arguably the biggest factor in this is our failure to implement a real track and trace strategy uh, which could give us more sort of dynamic management of the process but you know even with that more um, dynamic track and trace strategy in place um, again, we've had some recent numbers out of an academic group here, um, Louise Smith et al, who showed that levels of adherence to some of the recommendations, uh, particularly amongst certain groups, are really not high enough for us to um, maintain that sort of virus defence. And if you ignore the um, first two characteristics of these groups that have been, um, uh, by been not conforming to sort of recommended behaviour, you can really see why people have done it, and it largely comes down to economic needs. You know, some of the biggest risk factors were people who had a dependent child in the household and needed to go out and get food, lower socioeconomic grade, people needing to go out and work in order to earn and keep themselves going, people suffering greater hardship during the pandemic and so needing perhaps that mental health break of getting out, and people who worked in a key sector who've got this sense of duty and didn't want to let people down. Um, and wanted to get back to work as soon as they could. And the results of all of this are that you can see that while people entered um, quarantine, you know, 70-ish percent entered quarantine with the intention of, um, you know, of maintaining their sort of uh, quarantine. Oh, sorry, I've got somebody asking me to speak a little bit louder. Let me just, um, just check that I've got the right microphone on. I have indeed. Let me just move my microphone to the fore and I'll see if that helps. Um, so yeah, you can see that if although 70-ish percent people intended um, to um, respond, tended to maintain the sort of quarantine behaviour, actual numbers are down closer to 10%. Um, and so in this scenario, even with the track and trace capability being at a, a, a full uh, capability, being the, everything that we were promised the app would be a few months ago, um, it's pretty clear that we're still going to get um, disease spread, virus spread um, without changing this. And I think this, this comes back to something that Andy Burnham was saying on Newsnight last night, you know, no lockdown without support. Um, if people are going to be asked to quarantine, asked to lockdown, we have to ensure that those most affected by the pandemic have the financial, social services support they need to um, in order to maintain that lockdown. And one of the points I made in my last talk was about the difference between elastic and plastic deformation. And what I mean by this, and you'll have to forgive the engineering terminology, is that elastic deformation is something you can stretch and it snaps back. Whereas a plastic deformation is where you bend something and it doesn't bend back. It maintains the shape it's taken. Um, and if you've ever played with sort of elastic materials, you'll know that the, even if he's frankly just on the, you know, your own pants, you'll know that the more they're stretched, the less likely they are to return back to their original shape. Um, and so as this lockdown has been extended, you know, the forecasts, my forecasts of a snapping back to this is the old normal rather than the new normal get rather stretched. And while I still think 
the, the fundamentals of human behavior will not be changed by this lockdown. We will not see a fundamental shift in our needs, our desires, our behaviors, our need for human contact and to get together face to face. The longer the lockdown goes on, the more we see certain behaviors or trends embedded and particularly the acceleration of certain trends that I'll talk about as we go through the section about recovery because what recovery looks like and what your strategy looks like changes as we start to get more of this plastic deformation in our behaviors and less sort of expectation of an elastic snapback to where things were before and that affects a whole variety of sectors um, particularly retail as i'll come on to talk about To, to kind of finished up on the on the bad news i'm afraid we, we're not done yet you know as i mentioned we're entering the typical flu season we were expecting virus numbers to increase anyway um but we're going into it now with a you know a large contingent of people who've completely lost faith in the government you know, in terms of managing this virus and some people who are still convinced that the virus itself is a hoax um we've got an app now which is functional and lots of people are campaigning people to get on it but i think given the lack of trust the number of people who are going to go and download the app is, is definitely diminished. Uh, my, even my own Twitter poll, which is a, you know, a, a self-selected group of my followers who are probably largely, um, you know, more technology literate um, and perhaps more trusting in the government, or at least more willing to perform civil actions in order to support the cause. Uh, even there, only about 60% said they were going to download the app on the, on the day of its launch. Um, a very significant proportion, therefore, are not going to. And again, as I say, that's amongst a, you know, a, a, an educated, technology savvy audience. Um, I think so once we get out into the sort of the, the broader population, particularly those who are inhabiting Trafalgar Square, Square recently, you know, the, the numbers are going to be relatively low in terms of adoption. The flip side to that is the latest research says that actually the Track and Trace program doesn't need truly mass adoption, that we genuinely can get a result, even with sort of 10, 15, 20 percent adoption. So I'm hoping that we're heading in that direction. But, you know, it's not just the virus which is going to challenge us in the coming months. If you look at the last set of figures, and these are released quarterly um, in terms of redundancies, um, if these follow the pattern in terms of GDP, we could be seeing a, a redundancy spike um, that gets up towards or even beyond 2008 levels there. Um, and so, you know, lots and lots of people struggling in terms of income. Um, and you know, not a great picture on the horizon for recruitment outside of specific sectors. On top of all of this comes Brexit. There's still a huge amount of uncertainty there. Lots of debate. I think last time I showed the the sort of the bets from the different investment houses. You know, today's evidence is much more anecdotal, but nonetheless, you know, it's still a very very good chance that we come out of the trade talks with no deal over Europe. Um, and for all sorts of industries, particularly in manufacturing, logistics, uh, anybody shipping beyond the, the borders of the UK, um, that could be absolutely devastating. So that's the bad news. <laughs> and you know, forgive me, the next section is going to be you know, at best silver linings. Um, still cloudy, but I'm going to try and show some bright spots, um, some possibilities, because I do think we're seeing some prospects and certainly some direction in terms of what the strategy is for these sort of these sectors now um it's change and i'll because i come to it at the end you know we're going to require some fairly significant adjustments to our behavior to our strategy to our long-term plans and a lot of industries but i think we're starting to see some level of indication of what that looks like and where that goes and as i'll come to in the last section you know there are some opportunities here as well created by or at least augmented and accelerated by um, the virus that may be um, giving you some pointers towards our future direction so in terms of recovery, I've decided to look at a few particular sectors, uh, ones where free is particularly strong, one where I've had a lot of interaction in, in recent uh, months and weeks in terms of what those sectors look like. And the first one is retail. And I think retail is, is and forgive me for, for using this phrase, you know, retail is the sector which has perhaps the strongest indication, the strongest direction on what's next. You know, as I pointed out in the last talk, um, you know, lots of retailers were already in serious trouble before the virus happened. Um, they, that trouble has been uh, amplified. 
um, any sort of remaining crutches they had have been kicked out from under them. Uh, and we've already seen some collapses, very, very large swathes of redundancies. But we've also seen a very clear picture of what the future looks like. And this comes back to this elastic versus plastic deformation that I talked about. This shift to online retail, particularly for less popular categories like groceries, is not going to reverse. I think you know, we, we're going to begin this process now for these for these behaviours to become embedded. And it's pretty clear now that a very large proportion, you know, probably 50 percent plus of our long term retail um, is going to be digital, is going to be online. Uh, and so, you know, there is now political cover um social cover whatever you want to call it for retailers who perhaps haven't made the big investments in that direction yet to probably make the the changes that they need to and that's you know a big negative for a lot of people i think we'll see a lot more redundancies um but we will see some more investment in in these retailers trying to make that shift and capture a portion of the digital market um what that looks like for different retailers is going to be very very different i think there's still a lot of experimentation to do it's not one clear model there's no clear obvious example to replicate you know other than the single simple guidance that consumers are obsessed by low friction and if you can give people a low friction experience that delivers them what they want with the minimum of effort you're probably going to get repeat business uh, you know, just focus on this fact that human beings are fundamentally lazy in these things um, and don't want to exert a huge amount of effort, except for some of those goods that are particularly special to them. And conversations Simon and Rebecca and I were having just before we started, you know, we're seeing already anecdotal evidence that one of those sectors that always does well in a downturn is doing well, and that remains luxury goods. So another sector that's probably perhaps most in limbo right now and you know with no obvious way out is the food and beverage sector. Um, you know pubs that were just about surviving pre curfew have uh, started to um, point to the, the sort of tail off in their in their revenues that that's already caused um, and our, you know, we've seen a number of closures again it's anecdotal at the moment. Um, but just in my Twitter feed just following people in the food and drink industry um, seeing you know. Uh, owner operator after owner operator putting out that this is going to be their last week of trading that they've done what they can to survive this far um, but with the curfew in place and numbers down they just can't survive any longer you know that this is this is particularly devastating because this is one of those areas that we know will come back one of those areas of human behavior that we know is not going to change you know even with the the big shifts we've seen in recent years towards people drinking less drinking later drinking higher quality this industry has adapted in large part and while there's been some big you know high profile failures you know the industry has done a very very good job of adapting to people's needs and, and the industry i think has a great history of adapting to changing tastes and behaviors but there's only so much you can do on zero revenue and for me this is one of those sectors that the government really does need to be investing in really does need to be supporting and i don't think that support looks like eat out to help out um, i think there is a measure of that but really it is about funding fundamental business transformation for those that can but accepting that a large number of these businesses cannot transform they do not have an obvious alternative proposition um, and that, you know, alongside some partnership work between them and their landlords, um, there really does need to be some support to keep these businesses sort of dormant um, until the opportunity comes for them to, to rise again. Um, and you know, right now, it doesn't look like we're going to see that. But I think as the, the industry is lobbying very, very hard at the moment, particularly the nighttime industry is lobbying very, very hard. And I'm hopeful that we'll see some new measures in the next few days um, that might um, offer some sort of um, some basic level of support to keep some of these businesses going through an incredibly difficult period. Now, what connects both these sectors um, is the commercial property sector, retail and um, F and B. And you know, here I think is a really interesting conversation going on, where having been through the initial panic reaction of sending everybody home with a laptop and Zoom and realizing that actually that worked okay and that lots of people got more done and could be productive you know most companies now are still wrestling with and will be wrestling with for some time the cultural realities of a remote or hybrid workforce 
um, and I did a session about this yesterday just specifically about the aspect of learning um, when your workforce is remote um, and how actually all your old practices in terms of onboarding and teaching new and young members of staff have to change as soon as you go to a hybrid model you have to treat everybody as if they were remote because otherwise you're going to be excluding people um, and this is true of um, remote workers as well and hybrid workforces across beyond just learning you have to shift to much more sort of asynchronous patterns of work where you can't just expect everybody to be able to jump on a call if you're genuinely giving them flexibility about their working day uh, and relying on them to deliver, deliver uh, results rather than hours. Um, you know, so many aspects of this uh, need, still need a lot of thought in terms of policy development, process development. And you know, it's going to take some time for that to shake out, for people to get those processes in place and really get it sorted. The longer lockdown goes on, the further organisations will get into the process of, of reorienting themselves to a hybrid working world. I don't think most companies will go to fully remote. I don't think people will abandon offices altogether for all sorts of good reasons that I laid out in the last seminar. Um, but undoubtedly, I think footprints are going to be smaller. You know, we've already seen actually that the average size of companies is shrinking anyway. Um, even the, you know, if you look at the revenue per head of behemoths like Google and Facebook, um, they make many times more uh, revenue per head than the, the, the giants of old, the GEs or the General Motors. Um, and so they just need less space relative to their total revenue. Uh, and we're also seeing organisations increasingly, or rather propositions increasingly made up of networks of smaller organisations who operate and can operate out of co-working spaces, whether they're pulled from you know, small agencies, freelancers, you know, creative groups, consultants, all sort of pulled together, or services groups all pulled together to deliver a particular proposition. And so all of those organisations are likely to need you know, smaller foot plates, smaller floor plates um, for their operations. So I think we're going to see the average sort of footprint for, for offices shrink and continue to shrink. Arguably, this is you know, very much an existing trend. Um, offices will return um, with slightly different demands on what those offices look like. Um, they're, they're certainly not going away altogether, but I think the proposition is going to have to shift, not only to take account of the sort of the distancing measures, but in terms of the demand from people from what they want from an office further down the line. From a residential perspective, lots of my fellow futurists have been pointing towards a, what they expect is a big trend towards de-urbanisation. People scared of pandemics and viruses, realising now that they can work almost entirely remotely and decamping from their homes in the suburbs and the cities out into the sticks and the coastlines. Some anecdotal evidence of house prices in the particularly beautiful parts of the UK already going up. Um, but this feels like a pretty unsustainable trend to me. For a start, you know, most people can't move. School provision is not there. Um, you know, the people who will be able to move are the ones who can afford appropriate provision in terms of school, perhaps private schools, or can afford to move to those areas um, that have got provision um, and have got the level of seniority in their careers um, in order to do that. But actually, the vast majority of people, I think, are not about to decamp from the cities. And if they do, it's going to be a real problem for us nationally as we start to tackle future issues like ageing, uh, like climate change, where actually the best situation for the country as a whole and for, for, for the city regions is to have people densely packed in cities where services are cheaper to deliver, uh, where transport costs are lower, they can use public transport, and actually their carbon footprints are much lower um, because of the, sort of the shared warmth uh, of the stored heat and concrete in the city streets. So, for all sorts of reasons, I hope the urbanization won't happen. I don't think it will happen beyond a particularly moneyed class of people in their sort of in that 35 to 55 bracket. Um, some younger freelancers, but primarily those with you know, children well into their school career or beyond their school career who can afford to get out of the city and move to somewhere particularly beautiful. I think the vast majority of people are going to maintain their location. Uh, and until, you know, for 20 or 30 years, until the population starts to decline in the latter half of this century, um, I don't see really, really, really massive changes in the residential environment, other than actually what the demand is for. Um, and I think the, the, we will see continuing demand for uh, sort of multi-occupancy places, whether that's three and four generational homes, or whether that's these sort of large build-to-rent places um, that are occupying people who are increasingly single later and later in life. So onto the, the, the brightest sparks, the, the, the real sort of um, 
sunshine, beams of sunshine coming through the clouds. Um, you know, what are the rays of light? What are the opportunities coming out of this crisis, uh, or at least going through this crisis as we continue to be? You know, the first thing I wanted to say was, and I'll come back to this point, you know, now is the time for radical decisions. Um, it feels like we're at that sort of um, point of inflection now where we've survived so far we're starting to get visibility of what the future environment looks like and we now have under duress the sort of the political cover for making some really bold decisions about our organizations and about our businesses and, and in some ways that's coming in you know in the mildest ways in sort of in terms of accelerated digital transformation we're seeing organizations who've been planning to move to more digital interfaces for their customers, digital operations for their staff, realizing that they just can't afford to keep their old manual processes going any longer and investing heavily in digital transformation. This is a great time to do that. And your shareholders will completely understand why you have to increase uh, the investment that you're making. Um, leaving legacy models behind, you know, people who had, you were maintaining sort of, um, uh, bricks and mortar services, but we were declining, uh, declining user bases. Uh, people, you know, dealing in cash, and yeah, this is not a good, not good news for a lot of people. Um, but actually, people moving away from cash, perhaps, um, yeah, and people recognizing that they really need to start thinking much more clearly about the future in terms of their workforce, the skills they need, the technology they need, where their business is going to come from, what their audience wants from them. Um, and investing in innovation experimentation where they can afford to. And, you know, investing particularly time, um, you know, I think lots of people thought that lockdown would afford them time. It doesn't seem to have done. We are as busy as ever, if not more busy. For the simple expedient, actually, something people didn't consider going into this, that working remotely actually consumes more time than operating side by side, where lots can be done um, by just sheer exposure to each other, by subtle glances, picked up conversations. Um, all of that has to be transla translated into sort of conscious, manual, formal processes in a remote working environment. And that's incredibly time consuming. Hence why so many of us I think, are spending so long on Zoom calls right now. But you know, we, we need to change that. We need to get out of that trying to replicate the office habit and starting to think about, okay, what does a hybrid world look like and what radical changes do we need to make in order to make our organization operate uh, efficiently and productively in a hybrid world? So something else we're seeing, and I already referenced this advent of cash briefly, is a, a decline potentially in the friction in our operations. And this has been possible for some time, um, and you know, arguably a trend for some time, but I think it's really been accelerated by COVID, where people have recognized actually some really big points of friction in their organizations and taken, again, under duress or, or um, motivated by the requirements of the virus and lockdown to take some different decisions and perhaps slough off some, some old legacy behaviors um, that really cause big friction in the business. And you know, the obvious one here is cash. You know, cash uh, level usage was dropping precipitously before the crisis. Um, usage of cash halved in the first few weeks of the crisis, um, you know, from an already dramatic falling rate. Um, and in many ways, it doesn't feel like it's going to come back post crisis to any great extent. I think what was expected to be a you know a, a sort of you know five year, ten year decline um, of cash, um, you know, was was. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been you know, dramatically accelerated. And so I think we're, we're going to have a really difficult conversation to have post COVID um, about the underbanked and the unbanked and those who still desire or require cash to work with cash um, and the, the access for them to digital payments. But for lots of us, it means lower costs. Um, it means lower friction. It means opportunities to reinvent checkout experiences in a retail environment. You know, lots of interesting stuff there. Um, the talent pool, I think, is also really interesting. You know, once we are set up for hybrid working, remote working, we've got our processes in place. Actually, why do we still bind ourselves to the recruitment pool we used to operate with? Why aren't we recruiting globally, um, looking for people with the, with, you know, with the best talents on a meritocracy? And also, let's be honest, taking advantage of 
uh, you know, potentially lower wages around the world to bring in skills that perhaps we couldn't afford here. Given our incredible shortage of skills from, the, from a digital perspective, I think a lot of organizations are going to be taking you know, belated advantage of, of this move towards a more remote working behavior to leverage that global recruitment pool. And then finally, just in terms of you know, this accelerated digital transformation I talked about, actually a lot of our interactions between our suppliers and our, and our distribution uh, could get better in this scenario. We could find actually we shift to much more digital interactions, people finally sorting out aged and archaic processes um, and streamlining some of our critical business behaviors. The um, last couple of things I want to talk about, rising demand. You know, if you are in any of the sectors um, that I list here uh, and you've got uh, on an online proposition, you're probably doing pretty well. Um, PS5, you know, is a great just anecdotal example of this, sold out incredibly quickly when announced and they're now rushing to manufacture more because people are looking for entertainment during lockdown. I think the same is probably going to be true of the Xbox Series X and Series S out next month or, yeah, next month. Um, you know, cleaning and hygiene, personal transport, fitness and wellness, you know, all of these, I think, in many ways are underserved sectors and there are opportunities to compete. You know, I, it feels sometimes like, um, particularly the media and entertainment sector is flooded and then somebody comes up with a novel, comes up with a novel proposition um, and, you know, and takes the world by storm and carves out a niche. And I think there really is enormous opportunities still here for people doing innovative things and not just around these particular businesses, but the way they're delivered, whether that's, um, you know, uh, drone-based delivery on the streets, um, whether that's uh, new home hardware, um, you know, new workout um, regimes, all sorts of things. I think we're going to see a lot of innovation here in the next few years. So just to summarise, just to finish up there, to come back to this point about now being the time for, um, you know, now being the time for um, radical decisions. And this is a chart, or at least my version of a chart that I saw on a talk I did yesterday. Uh, and it was used by a, a psychologist, um, Dr. Hazel off, off the BBC. Um, and it's originally a, a diagram created by, um, I think it's got a name there, uh, Virginia Satter, that's right, um, to model changes in human behavior um, in a family sort of family therapy context, but it's been used in the, um, in the organizational change industry for a long time. And this is sort of my COVID version of this diagram. You know, I think we, we, were, we were bubbling along happily in our status quo. We hit this dramatic change event uh, of COVID. It plunged us into chaos. And do you know what? We cope pretty well with that chaos. But we're starting to get a vision of what, and forgive me for the phrase, the new normal might look like now. And we're starting to recognize what our radical interventions, our radical transformative ideas might have to be in order to get us that new normal, to create a situation where we can survive and thrive in that new normal. And we're now about to embark on this period of integration, where actually now's the time to take these radical steps, to work out what it means for our organization, to push them out, so that actually in, you know, in 2021, we can start to ride the wave of this of recovery uh, in this new normal. So that's me. I shall leave plenty of time for questions and invite uh, Simon back into chair. I know he's picked up some questions from you already. Uh, and I'll leave this nice thing on the screen just for a few seconds more uh, to plug my books, because I've got to plug my books, otherwise my publisher tells me off. <laughs> plug, plug away, plug away. <laughs> We, I'm, I'm just going to start off with with uh, with two for one, just to get some 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 value, Tom. So, on the reality aspect, just a couple of questions here. Are there some bright spots in the slightly bleak picture of today and the follow up? Who do you think has adapted best so far? Um, one, I mean, one obvious bright spot, if you are looking to innovate, is the availability of capital. I mean, there is a lot of cash sloshing around at the moment and people looking for returns. Um, and so if you are looking to raise funds, either as a small organization, you know, particularly sort of angel or venture capital investment, or actually as a larger organization to spray, spin out, spin off, you know, now's a really good time to go to market to be going to raise some money if you've got a proposition that fits some of those categories, or it's particularly in some of those sectors that I talked about. Yeah, I think I, I will, but I will also come back to my answer from the, from the last session, which is, I've seen, been really, really deeply impressed by the speed of adaptation, particularly for a lot of small organizations. 
um, you know, and I mentioned the brewery last time, you know, hairdressers selling up shop and buying vans, you know, and creating, you know, well, well equipped, you know, highly sanitized mobile hairdressing salons, um, events companies who, you know, merged with sort of, you know, digital marketing agencies with experience in video um, and very rapidly created sort of, you know, um, online conference propositions. Um, you know, conference organizers, you know, even small chains of commerce running really, really incredibly successful events, you know, using platforms like Hopin um, to do these things. And, you know, free, you know the, this event series, I think the, the attendance from people who've had at these has been absolutely incredible. People recognizing the opportunity, the need for people to have this conversation, finding a platform to do it uh, and, and building it, building events like this. Mm. Just had a question from, from Owen. Uh, is the current work economic model sustainable regarding the constant need to seek out continued growth and profitability? Is this concept now outdated? I think there is a really good argument that it is, but I think the transition is going to be a very slow one. I think it's really going to take us a lot of time to get our heads around a model predicated on full employment or the, the chase you near know, the, the pursuit of full employment, the pursuit of growth, um, of a, a fairly unrestricted globalization, um, particularly with regards to people leaping tax domains. You know, all of those things need addressing. And, you know, there is a, there's a lot of skepticism around an idea of a Green New Deal, but we know we need it. I mean, we know that we need to um, get towards a zero carbon environment. We know we need to take account of the impact that both the economic downturn and potentially the automation in the future are going to have on our employment base. And so, you know, I think you're starting to see much more serious conversations in government and beyond about things like universal basic income, about how we fund lifelong learning, um, about how we build um, homes that can sustain us through the environment. I've had some, uh, I'm actually doing a talk for Extinction Rebellion later. Um, around this, you know, there there is a a more widespread conversation about this. And while you know the Liberal Democrats, you know, don't have an awful lot of power at the moment, I think they have just uh, adopted universal basic income as a core policy tenet, or at least they're moving in that direction. I, I, I'm not wholly convinced by the arguments for UBI, but you know, these are all components of a conversation about a very different society at some point in the none too distant future. Mm. Just had a question on the recovery aspect. Uh, do you think there will be more government support for companies getting back on their feet? I think there will have to be. Um, you know, again, this is, comes back to the, the 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 difference between what I would like to see and what I you know what I do see. Um, I think anybody watching this government for the last six months and declaring that they have faith in them um, has an awful lot more um, optimism than I do. Um, but you know, given the, the, the collapse in GDP, the realities of our, you know, our exit from Europe, you know, there is an opportunity for our government to be fairly radical in terms of printing money, frankly, um, to support and fund um, measures to keep business going, keep businesses going. And so, you know, while the, the furlough scheme, obviously, as was, is coming to an end, um, we have the new and more sort of flexible furlough scheme. I, I think we're going to have to see some sort of fairly large scale government investment as they try and dig us out of the 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 hole that the economy is in. And you know, put it in terms of you know the measures that were taken in the, in the aftermath of the two thousand and eight collapse. Mm. You, know, in, in, you know, billions, trillions invested at that point across, around the world in terms of trying to restore the economy. And, and this this dip looks even bigger. So, given the sort of the freedom from the shackles of of, of any criticism, they're not even necessarily real shackles, but the notional shackles of being in Europe in terms of um, state support for business, it feels like the governments are certainly free to be very radical, and maybe they'll trumpet that as one of the benefits of Brexit in the new year um, when they come out with some schemes to support business. You mentioned furlough. We've just had a question from Jane. Uh, furlough allowed employees to spend a large amount of time with their family. Do you think that may have caused some to consider their work-life balance? And if so, what impacts could this have for employers in terms of staff loyalty and engagement? 
So yes and no. Um, yes, in I think I'd really like that to have been the outcome for a lot of people. Um, and it would be you know, wonderful to see organisations. If, if you really adopt a properly sorted, flexible slash hybrid working environment, you can release your employees to work completely flexible days, not just flexible hours, but completely flexible days, as long as they're delivering the things they need to deliver when they need to deliver them, as long for you and for your clients, you should be able to be completely flexible about what they do, when they're spending time with their family, you know, when they're getting out of the office and going for walks. People should be able to have a much better balance of mental and physical health with work, even if it does take, you know, it takes time to develop the discipline to do that. And you know, I'm a prime example. You know, I came out of this real sort of, you know, hard work, seven till seven sort of environment. And it took me probably 10 years of self-employment to forgive myself from, you know, to, for going and having a nap when I needed it or going for a walk when I wasn't being productive. And I, you know, I hope it doesn't take most people 10 years after lockdown to get to that much better sort of work-life balance. The, the counterpoint to this is this, this whole sort of, um, um, you know, your, um, I'm missing the commute movement. You know, the number of people, and I have to say particularly men, I've heard in recent weeks say, God, I really missed the commute. You know, the commute was when it meant I got out of doing breakfast with the kids. Um, it was the it was the hour when I listened to podcasts on the way out to and from work. It was it was me time, yeah, you know, when I got to play on my Nintendo or whatever without sort of interruptions and having to do chores and stuff. Um, you know, those people are really craving a return back to the old ways of working because it it frankly suited them. Um, and so I think those people are, have probably had, you know, they already had quite enough family contact. Thank you very much. And they're quite looking forward to getting back to the way things were. Okay. I, I won't talk to you about commuting again, Tom. <laughs> uh, just had a, um, a question in from, from Joe. Uh, great presentation, Tom. He says, but do you have a take on whether the pressure people feel to be in the office if their boss uh, has, in, the, in it has plastically changed? Um, I think most people's bosses haven't changed because it's a massive cultural shift. And so while individuals are sort of wrestling with their own sort of Protestant work ethic and, and thinking, oh, God, I must, I must be at my desk, you know, nine hours a day. I, want, I don't want people to look, think I'm shirking or I'm lazy. Middle managers are wrestling with, oh, God, I've got, you know, these six, 10, 25 people. I don't know what they're doing. I'm used to being able to you know, look over them, make sure they're OK. How do I check in with them? You know, make sure that they're delivering. I don't want any nasty surprises on due date for work. You know, all of these things. You know, both groups of people are really wrestling with this. And as I say, it took me 10 years to get over this. I, I think we need really, really conscious, deliberate retraining programs for staff and for managers to get to a point where this works properly, where this works well. Without it, you, you know, every company that doesn't do that is going to face some really difficult cultural challenges in the coming weeks, where you get that mismatch between those who adapt quickly and those who adapt slowly. Mm. Just a question on uh, coming on opportunity. Uh, you recommend radical action, but how do companies choose when to act? This is a really hard question. And I think it's part of why I pointed to that, that chart at the end, because it's the question I've been wrestling with. And I think now most sectors, with the exception possibly of F&B, because we don't know, you know when and with what speed that's going to come back, I think most sectors are starting to get a picture of what the future looks like. You know, in healthcare, you know, we know we're going to have problems with staffing um, post-Brexit. You know, we know that actually we're going to have a fairly long-term investment to make in health and hygiene getting beyond the levels we were at before you know retail we know that you know we're probably going to be heading towards 50 percent plus of, of retail happening online so what are we going to do if you own property you know all of these things are starting to get a bit more visibility about what the future looks like and with that visibility you can make that radical change and, and so i think you know for a lot of organizations q4 is you know and, and kind of now really but q4 is going to be the period for that radical change i think you with with few exceptions you're starting to get enough visibility now to know what those investments might be and you know i'm not i'm not changing my my like my long-held mantra which is the thing you should be investing most in is adaptability mm -hmm. the thing you should be investing most in is okay when the next big shock comes along are we ready to survive it but you know right now you you've got to be shifting that adaptability to 
okay, how do I move my sort of core operating model to what 2021 looks like, not what 2019 looked like? And um, what do you think, as a follow up to that, what do you think are the next sectors for growth that you think might do well in the next year? So I think there's going to be a real acceleration in people replacing people in certain environments. So you, know, you look at who's been under the greatest criticism um, during this lockdown. Um, it, care homes and uh, warehouses, you know, particularly Amazon. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still another report out today that I saw Olivia Sol on the tech journalist retweet, you know, that Amazon, Amazon's warehouses remain a real COVID hotspot. Um, and, you know, or certainly their numbers are very hard to monitor. Um, and, you know, they've got a real challenge there. You know, you can replace most people in a workhouse right now. The technology exists. Um, you know, people are cheaper in a lot of scenarios, um, but with COVID, um, that the maths in that starts to shift. So I think we're going to see a lot of investment in automation, both physical automation in places like warehouses, manufacturing, logistics, um, but also in, in the sort of softer automation in places like care homes. Mm. So those sectors and all the supporting sectors are going to continue to do well. You know, if you look at the jobs boards, seeing people in telecoms and IT now, they're still pretty strong. Um, and then anybody servicing people in a remote environment, you know, if you are servicing people working from home, like, you know, trying to get a good webcam at the moment is really, really hard um, because they're, you know, they're still selling really, really well. Um, you know, office home, people are setting up home offices and realizing this is a long term now, so they should be investing in it. You know, backdrops, green screen, bookcases, you know, um, and then all the stuff that goes around that leisure. The last thing I say, you know, there's a really, clearly a really strong industry at the moment is UK vacations. You know, staycations or you know vacations around the UK. You know, it seems to be doing really well. The prospects for travel are not looking good. Lots of people not wanting to get on a plane anytime soon. You know, camper vans are like hen's teeth at the moment. Uh, there was a great um, someone wrote to the Guardian's consumer column yesterday saying, "I got sold a dud camper van. I paid thirteen thousand pounds for it, and two years later, I've been told it's it's uneconomical to repair um, because of rust." I'm looking at that going, there is no such thing as a camper van that's uneconomical to repair right now because you could ship that thing for 20 or 30 grand. You know, go and spend the money and get it welded up. Um, so, yeah, all of those sectors, I think, are probably going to do pretty well in the near future. Uh, I just had a question in from Chris. How can the UK be an international winner in the new normal? The, the, the answer to this hasn't really changed, actually, which is, look, we're a small island. And we can be really radical about our response to climate change. And it, it depresses me immensely that we've made such terrible use of our natural resources and our relatively small scale to this to date. You know, we could have been a you know, fully running on renewable energy some time ago with the right investment, um, with you know, energy storage, you know, expansion of places like Denorwig and similar situations or molten salt storage or increasing our battery storage on small scales. You know, we, could have, we could have been really radical on that and created both an industry, a world leading engineering industry in that sector and consulting sector, um, you know, cut our carbon footprint and created a lot of jobs in the process. Um, we could have done the same with, you know, we, done a, we could have done a much um, greater program in terms of domestic retrofit, um, in terms of um, shifting to electric vehicles and cycling. You know, all of these things are huge opportunities, both government and private investment, that could create world-leading industries. Um, you know, I always have to say nuclear as well. You know, we, we've got some great strengths there. Uh, and we haven't done it. You know, we haven't, we haven't um, seen government impetus on that. Um, and the, the appetite from industry has been growing, but still quite conservative. Uh, and, and that's a real disappointment. But I, you know, I still think the opportunity is there. You were a small island with incredible natural resources and incredible engineering and science resources, and you put those two things together, and they look exa they look like a great response to the, the biggest challenge of our age. Okay, I'm trying I'm trying to fit in as many questions as we can. I, I hope we've got time for another two or three at least. But quite a few on on environmental issues uh, coming up higher up higher up the agenda, um, and a specific one here from Cara who who says, how does the roadmap to zero carbon by 2030, feature in this future reality, recovery and opportunity. So in, in many ways, it's not a pretty picture from a carbon footprint perspective, because we're going to have to do some fairly radical interventions in terms of building and construction. Um, the flip side to that is when we do, we can build much better. 
um, you know, we, we should be, when we're knocking down, re, you know, 1970s concrete retail parks, we should be building, you know, zero carbon combined heat and power, solar panel laden, um, you know, beautifully thermally insulated homes, schools, um, you know, frankly, restaurants and bars when the recovery comes and, and you know, shared workspaces. But, you know, the, the building process itself undoubtedly releases an awful lot of carbon. Uh, and likewise, you know, all of us sitting at home, um, you know, consuming enormous amounts of uh, bandwidth and you know, physical goods shipped, you know, from China uh, at relatively low cost, you know, also doesn't look great for our carbon footprint. But, you know, we've got to, we're going to have to do some sort of stimulus. And it comes back to my last answer. You know, there's going to have to be some stimulus in the new year, if not before. Um, to try and restore the economy and you know if we don't pursue that route of zero carbon uh, and demonstrate you know, and use it in a really sort of Keynesian investment sense to build you know new jobs new industries new expertise and if not growth then at least a level of stability in our economy then we really really missed an opportunity. Mm. Uh, a short but pertinent question from uh, from Michael would your views as expressed change at all if Brexit ends with no agreement? No, and I'm fully expecting Brexit to end with no agreement. Uh, and so that all that does is amplify existing challenges. You know, we're going to, the construction industry um, isn't, you know, doing too badly at the moment. Um, but we know we've got huge skills shortages in terms of, you know, if we were to get anywhere near building the homes we need to build, um, and particularly with the massive redevelopment that our cities are going to need in a, um, you know, post-COVID, um, you know, online retail, um, you know, hybrid working environment. Um, and, you know, they're going to be, we're going to really struggle to get those people in a no-deal environment, um, or in any, frankly, Brexit environment, particularly with no-deal. Um, you know, I think our manufacturers are going to struggle. Um, the the if anything it increases the case for large scale government investment in recovery um but I mean, right now i'm fully expecting a no deal i mean we've had the every time there's been a things could have gone one of two ways in the last few years whether that's elections or referenda um it's, it's gone the worst of the two ways so uh, i'm going lower again uh, and hoping that i'm wrong okay um another another, another question on on government support from Karen, what would be some unintended consequences of more government support? Well, inflation potentially, um, you know, uh, the devaluing of the currency internationally, um, it would um, you know, potentially have a knock on effect uh, on imports and rising food prices. You know, all of the usual economic effects of quantitative mm. easing basically, you know, printing money. Um, you know, the, 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 the counterpoint to that is, you know, everybody's struggling. You know the um, the U.S. economy. I think is um, in in some ways the, the the level of damage to the U.S. economy is, is has been somewhat hidden so far. I think we would find that a lot deeper than we thought. Um, there are some real winners. You know, places like Thailand and you know relations with Tasmania, which is apparently completely virus free and not a huge amount of industry there. But you know they're going to be doing really well in this post-COVID environment. Um, but you know I don't think I think the because so many currencies will be will probably have a be a bit soft. Um, I'm hopeful that you know ours isn't too bad in relation, um, but certainly imports and, and food prices, which were already going to rise uh, due to climate change, that's probably going to be the biggest challenge. And it's, it's one of the reasons why, not something I've talked about today, but in my presentation later, you know, I'm seeing a real um, resurgence in domestic agriculture, um, uh, not necessarily the traditional forms, but really, really high density agriculture. Uh, might not look particularly organic, mm. uh, but we're going to have to be growing an awful lot more stuff, both at home and commercially, domestically. Sure. Just just one last, time for one last question from Andres. It's, it's a bit of a long one, but a uh, uh, thought-provoking one. It appears that the intersection of AI, remote working, and global procurement could leave behind a very significant legacy of people who don't fit in as traditional jobs disappear. The transformation could be much faster than in the past, as it is likely to be driven by evolution on a distributed basis beyond the reach of high inertia government policy. What should people prepare for, especially the young? So I am one of the people, and there's a lot of controversy about this, I am one of the people who believes that machines will take, well, machines don't take jobs, they take work. That's a really important point to take out. 
no single human can be 100% replaced by a machine in their job pretty much because humans, the whole point of humans is that we're really flexible and adaptable. We do lots of different things. But you can replace a lot of the work with a machine increasingly, and that's true in professional services. It's true in construction. It's true in manufacturing. And so fewer people can do more with less. And it, it seems to me um, unthinkable. I, I really can't fathom a picture where we create more jobs than can be replaced by AI within the next 20 years. The flip side to that is I think it still happens quite slowly. You know, I, I, I use this example over and over again, but you know, it's what most of us have had access to Microsoft Office for 30 odd years. And most of us still use it pretty poorly. Like we scrape the surface in terms of what it's capable of. And I think the same is going to be true of AI and robotic process automation and machine learning. You know, it's going to take us quite a long time to really extract value from them. And so, you know, that process is accelerated when we're under pressure right now, when our business models are under pressure and we're looking to eke out more efficiency or eliminate people from the process. But it, it, the transition is not going to happen as fast as it might. And, you know, I'll give you a great example of this. We've been able to build um, robot call centers that not like the sort of you know the really annoying ones but ones that do a sort of you know a, a, an emotionally aware call center that can dynamically produce responses for probably five years now and we've replaced an absolute you know a small fraction of the million people employed in call centers in this country in the process it's going to take another 20 years before we replace you know 80 percent of those people those jobs are going to go um but they're not going to go quite as fast as the, as the real sort of doom mongers are predicting and you know, the, the most conservative estimates in terms of jobs that could be automated around 15%, 14, 15%, I think that's realistic within the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most of those jobs will be replaced. And so absolutely what do we have to do? We have to teach people to be adaptable. I don't think everyone's gonna have a job all the time. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna have to have something like, I'm, I'm not a total believer in universal basic income, but something along those lines that supports people when they're out of work. And I think we're gonna have to teach people to learn. Um, to constantly relearn new skills, um, new capabilities, uh, and retrain as the industries they were in do get, you know, or they get displaced from the industries they were in, they were in uh, and have to find something new. And that's going to be hard for a lot of people. The, 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 the bright side to this, the counterpoint, is I think we start to value humans more. I think every human starts to get paid more as, as the drudgery that people, uh, reg you know, um, grudge paying us for is increasingly taken by machines. But in you know, individual, human, there may be fewer total human salaries, but each of those salaries will be higher. And I think we'll really value human traits like craft and creativity uh, and you know, emotion and empathy. Great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we've just run out of time, but um, may I take the opportunity to thank you all for joining us today. We've had over 250 people on the webinar. So a special thanks to, to Tom for being so insightful and thought provoking as usual and good luck with a new book, details of which will be in the follow-up letter we send to everyone. A uh, big thank you to Rebecca and my team for being such a catalyst in pulling all of this together. Uh, Tom has agreed, I think this is going to turn into a trilogy, to come back in another six months, time to do a follow-up uh, and an update on this webinar uh, on a similar subject or a follow-up subject, and we will pass on that day to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, please stay well and keep safe. And again, thank you for joining us.